Hi there, my name's Ranger M, and I love to learn all things nature and conservation. So today I'm here at Herb Kevill Wetland at the Yarmouth Natural Heritage Area to learn all about wetlands. Today we're going to hear from the Environmental Leadership Program class, the Elgin Stewardship Council, and the Catfish Creek Conservation Authority and learn all things wetlands, how they function, and what they do for us and all the wildlife around us. So come on, let's go explore this marsh. Hi, I'm Joe. And I'm Evan. And today we'll be learning about our diverse wetlands. Wetlands are diverse and house many species. Wetlands are productive ecosystems where water covers the soil or is near the soil for varying periods of time of the year. Wetlands include a wide variety of habitats, such as lakes, marshes, ponds, bogs, tidal flats, river floodplains, and mangroves. All species in a wetland rely and support each other over over other throughout the food web. There are three types of species in a wetland, herbivores, omnivores, and carnivores. Herbivores only eat plants and don't eat any animals. Omnivores eat both plants and animals, and carnivore, carnivores solely eat meat. All life in a wetland is interconnected through the food web, and they all rely on each other. Members of an ecosystem perform many different roles that include producers, consumers, or decomposers. Food chains consist of a sequence of living things, beginning with green plants, progressing to animals that eat plants, and animals that eat other animals. Some animals feed on more than one other type of plant or animal, so food chains aren't just one straight line, but more like a complex web. Food webs are complex relationships, which may include many, organisms at each level of the food chain. Food webs are very important natural interconnections in a what eats what ecological community. A food web consists of all the food chains in a single eco ecosystem. Each living thing in an ecosystem is part of multiple food chains. Each food chain is one possible path that energy and nutrients may take as they move through the ecosystem. Let's look at a food web and see who eats who. First, the algae grows. Then the minnow eats the algae. Then the ducks eat the minnows. Then the bald eagle eats the ducks. The mosquito feeds off the bald eagle. And the frog eats the mosquito. And the bass eats the frog. And the snake eats the bass. The local pond has been filled with toxic industrial chemicals from a factory down the road. Due to this, the algae is killed off first. The minnows have nothing to eat, so they starve and die. The ducks also have nothing to eat due to the minnows dying, so they leave the pond. The bald eagle leaves due to no food from the ducks leaving. The mosquitoes have no bald eagles to feed off of, so they leave as well. The frog dies due to no mosquitoes for it to feed off of. The snake dies because there's no more bass that are feeding off the frogs and the snake feeds off the bass, so it dies too. Hello Grade 4s, I'm Adam and I'm Luke and we're with East Elgin's ELP class and today we're going to be demonstrating watersheds and the relationship with wetlands. Well, what is a watershed? A watershed is a region or area draining into a body of water. This could be our roads, our fields, our lawns, everyone lives in a watershed. And what's a wetland? Well a wetland is a region or area that stays wet or waterlogged for most or all of the year. This uh, would include swamps, marshes, and bogs. There are two types of pollution, non-point source pollution and then point source pollution. 
Point source pollution is pollution that can be traced back to a specific point. This would be something like a factory or um, sewage treatment plant. Non-point source pollution cannot be traced back to a specific point. This could be things like litter and oil from our roads dripping into our watershed and lawns as well. Every time it rains, herbicides like Roundup can get into our waters. So this is our model city. With this we'll be demonstrating how water gets from our roads and from our factories and things like that and bring pollutants down the creeks into our water. How do wetlands help with this? Wetlands are an important part of the watershed because they filter water by absorbing pollutants before they get into our lakes and rivers. This is why wetlands are often thought of as sponges because they absorb the pollution. This red coloring will represent industrial pollution from our factory. This blue will represent residential pollution from our roads and houses, so there's that. This yellow will represent sewage from our sewage treatment plant. And this green will represent farm runoff, so things like manure, pesticides, and fertilizer. And now we'll simulate rain with this bottle and watch carefully and see where all the pollution goes. Look at that. All the pollution went straight into our river right away, into our lake. In this town, this is, they drink from this. This is where they get their drinking water. And that's really gross. I don't want to drink from that. Ew. Yuck. Now we will do this again, but this time I have wetlands in our watershed. These sponges will act as wetlands. All right, so now we added these sponges here to act as wetlands to absorb the pollution. Now we're gonna make it rain again. As you can see, none of the pollution got into the lake because of the wetlands. This is why wetlands are so helpful with the filtration of pollutants. So how can you guys help with reducing pollution? You could litter or put it in a proper garbage can. You can avoid using lawn chemicals and just pick the weeds by hand. You could, instead of dumping chemicals in the grass or in your sink, you can take them to a dump and dispose of them properly. You can reduce the use of paper and plastics. And you can conserve water, so less water has to be treated and returned to our waterways. That's all from us. Thank, Thank you, you Great Forest. Hi everyone, my name is Nick. And I'm John. And today we'll be talking to you about the importance of cavities for secondary cavity users, uh, nesting boxes and the threats they face, and finally we'll be showing you how to make a nesting box of your own. Hey John, uh, what's that? Well, cavity trees are dead or dying trees that are found in the main, or the trunk of the tree or the main branch of the tree. Um, this is the, this is a natural occurring cavity that you'll often see in the trees around your around your area or wetlands around you. Um, you can find the pelated woodpecker, red-headed woodpecker, or chickadees who create these cavities in these trees. Um, however, some mammals and birds cannot create their own cavities and those are known as secondary cavity users. So examples of them would be a bared owl, um, a flying squirrel, or a wood duck like we have here. Um, these Secondary cavity users rely on the primary cavity users because they can they have physical limitations that uh, cannot allow them to create a cavity. So for our wood duck here, that would be its webbed feet and its rounded beak. Alrighty, so this is where you and I come in. So this is a natural one and this is a nesting box along with these two little guys here. They are man-made boxes for birds to have 
a safe place to live and keep away from all the intruders trying to get into their box. Uh, although most nesting boxes are good are a good habitat for many different species, some have a more animal specific design. An example of that would be our bat box here. So bats, unlike other flying species, uh, take off from a hang. The bat would fly up into its cavity here and when it's well rested it would fall and take flight from a hanging position. The secondary cavity usually commonly found in this area are the wood ducks. This is a male and female wood duck. They, uh, they rely on primary cavity, primary cavity users to build their nest for them. Um, and if we did not have these naturally occurring cavities, the wood ducks would not be able to reproduce successfully. Uh, if you look closely at the contents of the box, you can tell what types of animals had nested inside and if they were successful in reproducing. All right. If straw was found in the nest, it is a sign that uh, starlings were inside the, were present inside the box. And if moss was found, uh, the tonatory warbler was nesting inside this box. Um, another thing commonly found in these boxes are eggshells. If the eggshells are brittle, that means that uh, it was not a successful hatch and a critter got to the eggs. And if there was calcium, if calcium was sucked out of the eggs, there was a successful hatch that happened inside the box. Um, oh, yeah. Another thing that can be commonly found inside nesting boxes are feathers. So a lot of birds like to line their own nests with their own feathers. Um, however, feathers found can also be a sign of another bird invading the nest. Uh, nesting boxes such as that one are prey for uh, many different predators. So all their own is accessing the box. Uh, birds can just fly in, whereas a raccoon or a possum would reach their arm down inside the box. Uh, turn around until they can grab something. A uh, preventative measure that a lot of people do on their own boxes are they add a porch to a box or they would put it up high on a pole so that nothing could climb in and grab, uh, grab whatever is inside. All right, before we uh, show you our video on how to make a, uh, a bird box, we will have, we have two uh, key messages to take away from our presentation today. Uh, so firstly, cavities are very important for many wildlife habitats. Uh, secondary users rely on the primary cavity users um, because without them, they would not have a place to nest and would not be successful in reproducing. And also, in some areas, there are not enough trees for natural cavities to occur. So we can do our part and build our own wood boxes and put them in our habitats so the wildlife can live happy and have a safe home. Bye. Bye. Hi, it's Hayden and Cal from the East Elgin ELP class and we're going to talk to you guys today about the different species of birds in our wetlands and um, how to identify them and how they're designed to thrive and adapt in the wetland. The types of birds we're going to be talking about are the songbird, waterfowl and birds of prey. Let's take a look. Okay, this, the bird here on the far right of me um, that is the belted kingfisher. It is a species of bird that lives in our wetlands. Um, the kingfisher is very distinctive because of its white neck and uh, its very blue body. It's got a very sharp pointed beak which it uses to catch its prey. Um, it hunts fish that are in between 9 to 14 centimeters long. Uh, it will be perched up on a, a, on a branch out here in the wetland and it will dive down into the water. It uses a sharp point of beak to make a very little splash so it doesn't spook its, its, uh, its prey. Um, and yeah, that is the kingfisher. At. A group of birds is classified as songbirds because as you might have guessed, they output musical songs. In most cases, the purpose of these songs is to defend their territory or to attract female birds to mate and reproduce or the other way around, the females attracting males. A large songbird that is native to eastern and central North America, North America is the blue jay. Believe it or not, the Blue Jay is not just a baseball team in Toronto. 
but is a majestic songbird that can be found in your backyard. As you can see the picture of the blue jay here, it is distinguishable by the crown of feathers on its head. These feathers can be raised or lowered based on their mood, just like humans have facial expressions. The blue jay's plumage, which is a fancy word for the feathers of the bird, are, consists of many shades of blue the back, on the back side of the bird. The underside, including its neck, belly, and breast, are a white color, and the eyes, beak, legs, and beak of the bird are all black. These birds are usually about 22 to 30 centimeters in length. Something interesting about the blue jay is that they mimic their surroundings like a parrot. Except uh, blue jays do not mimic humans, but they mimic the hawk. They do this because they need to protect themselves as their only um, way of defense to protect their territory and not get eaten by the hawks and other predators. Additionally, an adaptation the blue jays have made is their short, strong beak that is ideal for cracking nuts as that is an important part of their diet along with berries and small invertebrates, making them omnivores. So Hayden, Hayden just talked about our songbirds. These four here are waterfowl, um, but these two specifically are important. This is a dabbler duck and this is a diver duck, and I'm gonna to talk to you guys why they're considered to be um, dabbler and diver. So this right here is a dabbler duck. It's a male mallard, dabbler duck. Um, dabbler ducks, such as the mallard, have uh, their legs um, essentially located underneath their body. Um, dabblers sit higher on the water, feeding on aquatic vegetation and small invertebrates um, on or near the surface, while diver ducks feed on similar um, vegetation, uh, but they live in different habitats and uh, their feet are directed at the back of their body. Um, the diver ducks normally live on larger bodies of water, while the mallard Dabber duck will live on small wetlands and small ponds. Um, I like to use the analogy um, airplane helicopter because when the so this is a canvas back diver duck when they get out of the water they kind of have to have a run at it like an airplane on a runway while the dabbler duck is like a helicopter where it just kind of takes two steps and it's out of the water. You can look at their feet and how they're designed these guys have way bigger feet used for swimming, while these guys are not much of a swimmer, even though they still do. Their feet are a little bit different. So we talked about the canvas back and the mallard. Um, so that's a diver, dabbler. These ones are considered dabbler ducks because their feet are essentially located under their body. Um, this is a female wood duck and this is a male wood duck. Um, very easy to tell the two apart just by looking at the color in their head and their, their, their body. They're looking at their beak. This one's got a really orange beak, while this one's got not much of a faded colored orange. Um, they got a white eye ring, uh, light colored throat, um, and a fine crest distinguish, distinguishes the female, both the male wood duck and the females of other species. Both sexes usually show a downward pointing crest at the back of the head. Um, and a long, bra uh, long, broad, square tails that are distinctive features while the wood duck is in flight. Um, these wood ducks have a sharp claws to allow them to perch on, uh, on snags, stumps, and branches because they nest in tree cavities. So trees like that there, that's, that's where a, a wood duck would nest. They like, they like to be out of the water. Um, the colorful male wood duck is unique among ducks um, in that no other ducks have a swept back crest, which the bird does. Um, in the early 1900s, the wood duck was extremely extinct in the area, but now has made a full recovery, recovery because of groups like Ducks Unlimited that have helped protect and preserve the species. Uh, the birds of prey, or the raptors, like us, are lucky to be at the top of the food chain meaning that there are very little worries about being hunted by other animals. This is because these animals usually soar at really high elevations, leaving very little organisms to look down on them. For example, the bald eagle can fly um, often at 10,000 meters, or 10,000 feet, sorry. Uh, this is still very high though. Um, this would be as high as stacking the CN Tower on top of itself five and a half times. Very high. Um, let's take a look at the red-tailed hawk, a species native to Canada. As you can see, 
The red-tailed hawk has very rich brown feathers on its back and it has a nice pale white color on its underside. Uh, also, it has a nice red color on its back tail feathers where it gets its name, the red-tailed hawk. Um, if you look closely, um, you can see its very sharp claws that are great for snatching its prey and its pointed beak that, that it uses for eating them. This hawk is a carnivore only eating meat. These birds are very opportunistic hunters. They like to live in places like open fields and wetlands like this where there's very little tree cover where they're able to soar over and circle around to find their prey. They use their very keen eyesight to do this looking down from very high distances too, like the bald eagle. Uh, they like to eat um, rodents like mice, gophers, but they have a very wide range of a diet, eating almost anything like snakes, salamanders, frogs, etc. They primarily do not hunt other birds, but they do sometimes if they find a weak bird that they can prey upon. Okay. Thank you guys for uh, listening to our bird watch uh, presentation. Um, we hope you learn lots. I hope this inspires you to get out and go for walks in nature and identify birds for yourself. Maybe buy an identification guide or something like that. Just and get out in nature. Right on. <laughs>
When you look at the coyote skull, you will see that they have sharp canine teeth at the front of their mouth. Coyotes use this teeth to chew bone and flesh of their meals. This is because coyotes also eat other animals. Coyotes also have molars at the back of their mouth to grind down bone. A fun fact about the coyote skull is that their eyes are on the front facing part of their head. This shows us that coyotes are predators. Eyes like this help them see their next meal as well as give them better depth perception. A coyote's pelt is much thicker in Canada climates because it has adapted to the cold weather up here. During the summer, a coyote will shed its winter pelt and grow a summer one that will often be much darker. This is to help them blend in with their environment. Next, we will look at rabbit prints. This is the rabbit's front foot and this is the rabbit's back foot. You can see that the rabbit's back foot is very long and skinny. This helps them get away from predators fast with a powerful stride. This long skinny foot can also act as a snowshoe in the winter to keep them on the top of snow. If you look at the bottom of a rabbit's foot, you will see that they have small hairs. Hairs like this give them traction on both snow and ice. A fun fact about rabbits is that they actually step with their back feet first. Rabbit scat can vary in color a lot. It can be very light or even very dark. A telltale sign of rabbit scat is since they are herbivores and eat plants, it will be little circle pellets. It will also be in piles because they stop when they use the bathroom. A fun fact about rabbit scat is that there's two types of it. One is called cecitropes, which a rabbit will eat to get more nutrients out of it. Another fun fact is that rabbits will make almost 300 pellets a day. When you look at the rabbit skull, you will notice that they also have two long front teeth just like the beaver. Teeth like this are what they use as scissors to cut down the vegetation that they eat since rabbits are herbivores. They, en they then use their sh flat teeth at the back to grind down their food. Rabbit's eyes protrude from their skull as you can see which gives the rabbit almost 360 degree vision. Rabbit fur adapts to its surroundings, such as an arctic rabbit is white because it lives in snow most of the year, whereas a cottontail, such as this one, will be tan or brown to hide with its surroundings, or to blend in with its surroundings to hide from predators. Rabbits also cool down by having veins run through their ears. This allows them to cool down since they cannot sweat. Rabbit pelt is also very warm and is very valuable. Our last animal is a raccoon. If you look at a raccoon's feet, you'll see that they also have nails. This helps them become better climbers. A fun fact about raccoon feet is that they, just like humans, they have opposable thumbs. This means that their thumbs help them grab onto their food as well as wash it off before they eat it. A f another fun fact about raccoon feet is that they sometimes look like baby human hands. Raccoon scat will often be very dark in color and be full of things such as berries, nuts, seeds, and they can be full of feathers, eggshells, pelt, fur, and bones as well. Although it's much less likely to find bone and fur in ra raccoon scat because it is just a much harder meal for them to catch and eat. Raccoons also use the bathroom in the same place every single time, which is a fun fact because not many animals do that. If you look at the raccoon skull, just like the coyote, they have two sharp canine teeth at the front of their mouth. They sometimes use these teeth to kill small mammals and birds, but more often they use the teeth at the back of their mouth to eat the vegetation and other things that a raccoon may eat. This is because a raccoon is an omnivore. Just like a coyote, raccoons in colder temperatures adapt a much thicker coat to keep them warm. Raccoons also have the black around their eyes and this is used because since they are nocturnal hunters it reduces glare and makes it so they can see better while searching and scavenging at night. A fun fact about raccoons is that they're actually colorblind too. That's all for our station mammal matchup. Remember that we learned that an ecosystem is a group or community of living things that interact in their environment. Also, a herbivore is an animal that only eats plants, a carnivore is one that only eats meat, and an omnivore eats both plants and meat. Have fun at your next station. <laughs>
Ella and my name's Taya and this is Copycat. So today we will be teaching you guys about animal adaptations and how humans have copied them. What are adaptations? Good question. So adaptations are a special skill which helps an animal to survive. So there's two types of adaptations, behavioral and physical. Organisms adapt and change to make their lives more comfortable, especially when faced with a new situation or surroundings. This is exactly what behavioral adaptations are. There are two types of behavioral adaptations, learned and instinctive. Learned behavioral adaptations is when the animal is not born with it, but they have to learn it. And instinctive is the exact opposite, where the animal is born with it. Some examples of behavioral adaptations include hibernation and migration. So now I'll be talking to you about the physical adaptations. So these are something where the animal is born with it and it is used in the environment to help it live longer. So this is an example of how ducks have webbed feet um, to help them push water um, when they're swimming, to help them go faster, and also how um, uh, ducks and stuff like that have feathers um, to help them keep them warm in the water. So adaptations is a natural thing and it is um, help to use them just live longer and this is why um, humans copy them just so that we can help um, our lives become easier. Now I will be giving you some examples of some animal adaptations and make sure you guys have your worksheets out so you can copy along and try to figure out how many animal adaptations and human copies you can find. The coyote uses its funnel-shaped ears to help them hear from far distances. A fun fact is coyotes can hear a mouse squeak from over 100 feet away. A heron stands in the water on its long stick-like legs. This helps them when they are walking in the water trying to find the tastiest foods. The hawk uses its talons to hunt and kill prey such as mice and rabbits and pick up objects. This long tail allows, allows the otter to push through the water in high speeds and it helps them with steering when they are at lower speeds. This jacket-like material keeps the fox warm to make it through the winter months. Birds have feathers that zip together, allowing them to be quite flexible but still sturdy. These feathers can be spread apart and cleaned with their back, with their beak, and when flight is required, they can put them back together. Like many other air-breathing wetland insects, the diving beetle requires a supply of air and unlike fish, it breathes air in through the sides of its body. Air is taken below the surface in a bubble that is attached to the back end of the be beetle. With this air, the beetle can stay underwater hunting for several minutes at a time. The webbed foot of the duck is a very important tool for pushing through the wetland, whether that be walking on the soft ground or paddling quickly through the water. Okay guys, so now we'll be talking to you about um, the human traits that we took from um, the animals. So I'll be talking to you about how um, we use them in our everyday lives and how it can make our lives easier. So this is the uh, flipper that we used um, to push more water uh, when we're swimming to help us swim faster. This is some Velcro, which is used to pull apart and put back together and is very strong, um, but it can be um, taken apart at any time when we need to. And these are some binoculars. So they're used to see farther away um, when we can't see that far um, and we want to see something closer up. And this is the Scotch Guard Outdoors. So it's used to spray on furniture and boots to help it um, become waterproof. And this is a fleece jacket, so um, when it's colder outside, we can put this on um, and it makes us all nice and warm. And these are some tongs for picking up um, smaller items or even just food at the dinner table. And this is a megaphone, which is um, used to amplify our sound so it can be heard from a lot farther away. And this is a snorkeling kit, so uh, once we put this on in the water, we can actually um, 
breathe underwater um, and opposed to holding our breath and we can stay there for a lot longer. And then we do also have um, a paddle here which is used to um, push water when we're canoeing for example to help us go a lot farther than just our regular hands. And last but not least we do have um, the stilts that are here um, to help us keep us off the ground and just to help us become taller. Okay guys so it's your turn to go home and think of some more connections that us humans um, took uh, such as adaptations from animals. Um, and we also have an outdoor activity um, that you can do later on uh, with your classmates. Okay guys, let's go on to the next station. Oh my gosh, a turtle! I didn't see it there, it was so camouflaged. I wish I could do that. <gasps> now I'm camouflaged too. That's an example of an adaptation. Thanks, Thanks for watching. Hello everyone, welcome to Marsh Monsters. My name is Kelly and this is Ethan and Michaela. Uh, today we are at the Herb Kebble Wetland in Sparta to identify some different microorganisms that are found in a wetland. There's a lot more species living in a stream, river, or pond than most people realize. Everyone thinks about fish, frogs, crayfish, or lily pads, but there are between 5,000 and 6,500 species of aquatic insects that often go unnoticed. Can you brainstorm some organisms that make up a wetland community? Try and think small and large. Pause the video here. What did you come up with, Kelly? I thought of fish, frogs, salamanders, and dragonflies. Those are some great ideas, Kelly. As you may have noticed in your brainstorm, there are a ton of uh, species in our wetlands, but there are many aquatic insects that you may have left unnoticed. In every part of the waterway, lakes, ponds, rivers, and streams, many organisms can be found. However, without microorganisms, we wouldn't have fish, waterfowl, or many other larger organisms. Aquatic insects are a very large group, but all have one thing in common. They all have at least one stage during their life cycle where they rely on water. I like to think of our ecosystem as like a building, and every species is its own floor. When one floor is taken out, all the floors above it crumble. And just like our ecosystem, if our macroinvertebrates get taken out, then the rest of the ecosystem gets destroyed, just like you learned in the Wearing All the In This Together video. Using these zoomed in photos, try and guess these macroinvertebrates. Those were some good guesses, guys. <laughs> when we look for bugs today, we'll find many different species that are at different stages in their life cycles. Kelly, can you name any? Oh, Dragonflies begin their lives as larvae in the water, then grow into the colorful dragonflies that we see flying around. During their lifetime, they eat several not so desirable insects, such as mosquitoes and flies. These aquatic bugs, such as dragonfly, can play, play an important role in our wetland ecosystem. At the bottom of the food chain, aquatic invertebrates provide an important food source for many larger wetland community organisms, such as frogs, toads, salamanders, Another example that you might be more familiar with would be a frog. As you can see here, we have plenty of different sized tadpoles that are all developing at different stages in their life cycle. Since each tadpole is at a different stage of development in their life, they are all at different sizes. As you can see, the largest tadpole has already started to grow feet for when he transforms into a frog, while the smallest one is still tiny. I noticed in the photos that all the tadpoles don't look the same. Is there a reason for this? Yes, that is because the marsh we are in is very diverse and has multiple types of frogs and tadpoles living here. 
depending on the location and quality of water, different species can be located. Using the macro of invertebrate identification key in your handouts, scientists have found a way to determine the qual water quality in the ecosystem. Even though scientists have come up with a way to determine the quality of the water using chemistry, there's also a way you can tell using the species in the ecosystem. Using the macro invertebrate identification key, you can tell that group one is very intolerant of pollution. These species include the right-handed snail, the water penny larva, and many more. Group two is moderately intolerant of pollution, such as the dragonfly nymph and the scud. Group three is fairly intolerant of pollution, such as the leech, leech, and group four is a very intolerant of pollution, such as the red-tailed maggot and the other few listed. Now to show you these species, we will be using our dip nets to find some macroinvertebrates. While searching for macroinvertebrates, you need to follow these few steps. First, fill up your bucket with clean water. Use the metal frame of the dip net to help you get into the sediment at the bottom of the wetland where many invertebrates hide. Skim the water or dip the water into the bucket as the invertebrates will be on the water surface. Since these organisms live in the water, we have to make sure we create a temporary habitat for them. Therefore, every container that is used for viewing should have clean water from your bucket in it. Then analyze your sample. All of these bugs found in our wetlands are called macroinvertebrates. Macroinvertebrates are organisms that have no internal skeletons that can be seen with the naked eye. Dragonfly larvae, crayfish, midge larvae, leeches, and the water beetles are all examples of aquatic macroinvertebrates. Be sure to release your collected organisms back into the water as soon as possible. Once you have collected and recorded your information from the sample, return it to the water, including all vegetation and mud. Macroinvertebrates are a very important part of a wetland community and are essential to a viable and sustainable ecosystem. At the bottom of the food chain, aquatic invertebrates provide an important food source for many larger wetland community organisms such as frogs, toads, salamanders, and fish. Aquatic macroinvertebrates can also help humans. Their presence and numbers in a body of water are a useful indication of the health of that body of water. All living things, regardless of size, have a place within a wetland community and their removal will upset the balance of the ecosystem. Thanks for joining us at Marsh Monsters today, everyone. everyone, welcome to Saining Fun. I'm Josie, this is Mackie, and that's Bree. A healthy environment supports a bunch of different native species, and we're going to teach you about fish, frogs, salamanders, newts, and turtles. So come with us. Hi, I'm here to teach you about fish. There's 122 different species of fish in Ontario, and each one of those species needs space, water, food, and shelter to survive. But certain fish are picky. You'll find big fish like pickle and lake, lake trout where it's deep and cold. But in marshes around here, you'll find sunfish, bluegill, bass, because they like it where it's warm, shallow, and has lots of shelter. You'll always find fish where there's vegetation because they're omnivores and they eat both plants and fish. So now that we know where we're gonna find our fish, let's talk about identifying them. Things like color, fin shape, whether it has two dorsal fins, whether your tail looks like a fork or is round, like a catfish's tail, the different markings you'll find, and depending on the mouth size with your bass, so smallmouth bass, their hinge is up higher, and a largemouth bass's hinge is down lower. These are all good ways to identify the fish you've caught. So here we have a largemouth bass. You can tell it's a largemouth bass because of the vertical stripes that you can kind of see. This helps it blends into the weed and protect it from predators. 
You can also tell this is a bass because of the torpedo shape, which means it's long and skinny. Whereas fish like sunfish, bluegills, they're panfish, so they're big and round, just like your cooking pans at home. So this here, this is a minnow. This is a bait fish. You'll find these at all, like down at your local beaches and anywhere where there's shallow water. Bigger fish like bass and perch all feed off these guys to grow big and strong. Here's our little bass. He's pretty small right now because he's just born, but measuring your fish is a good way to tell how polluted or not polluted your ecosystem is because the bigger the fish, the fish are thriving, they're growing, they got lots of food, they got safe water. So. plays a big role in these fish as we've learned. They have different markings and everything. Your fish like sunfish, you'll see they have a small dot on them. This is a good, this is a way that they protect themselves from predators because it makes it look like they're swimming the opposite direction. Pollution, invasive species, destruction of wetlands, and overfishing are all have a huge impact on the populations of fish. And as you learned earlier, if we lose one part of our food chain, we lose all of it. So by doing things like protecting our ecosystems and wetlands, respecting fishing limits, and making sure when you're fishing to properly dispose of your fishing line, your old bait, we can keep fish around for years to come. Now we're gonna pass it on to Mackie. She's gonna teach you all about frogs, salamanders, and newts. Thanks, Bree, for all the great information on fish. I'm Mackie, and today I'm gonna to be teaching you about frogs and salamanders in the marsh that we can find right here. First, we're gonna start where you can find frogs. You can find frogs right in the water because they like to keep their skin nice and wet and slimy. Next is tadpoles. Tadpoles are what frogs are before they become an actual frog and get legs and can hop around. This is a tadpole, but you can actually call it a froglet because it's already growing its legs. It takes about 14 weeks before it can actually have full legs. People sometimes get confused and think frogs and toads are the same thing, but they're actually much different. Toads have more bumpy skin and are found venturing off around the marsh, whereas frogs, as I said, like to be right in the water and soaking up all that water and drinking it. A fun thing about toads and frogs is that their, their tongue can get 10 times bigger than their actually bo actual body length. So if you think of a bullfrog, they can get up to 15 centimeters and their tongue's even longer than that. Frogs actually drink water through their skin. Unlike us, we drink them through our mouth, obviously. Now, if you think back to our watersheds, do you think they'd want to drink all that water that has the pollution in it? No, they would not want to drink that water, so they're a good, they are good to show if the water's polluted because they won't want to be in that water drinking all, of that chem all of those chemicals. This is a bullfrog. They're very common in the marsh here. They range from nine to 15 centimeters, but can get bigger than that. This one here is huge and you can tell if it's a male or female by looking at its throat. This here is a male because it has a yellow throat and its eardrum is bigger than its eye. A green frog is another very common frog they can find in the marsh here. They look a lot like bullfrogs because of their color and because of the stripes on their legs, but they're actually much smaller and their eardrums much smaller and they also have a ridge along their back. Next is a leopard frog. A leopard frog is also a very common frog and it's easy to identify because of its big black and brown spots all along its body. They also have a ridge like the green frog along its back. The American toad is the most common toad in our area and it's much smaller than a bullfrog and it has w the warts that I was talking about all over its body. Now let's talk about salamanders. The most common salamander in our area is the eastern redback salamander. There's two phases of this salamander, the redback and the leadback. I'm gonna show you the redback here. This is the redback salamander. This is the most common one and you'll most likely find this one. This is the first phase of the leadback. So these are, sorry. <laughs> these are easy to identify because they have a nice long red stripe on their back and the leadbacks have a grayish blue stripe along their back. Next are newts. Newts are much like salamanders, but don't get confused because newts live most of their life in the water and actually have gills so they can breathe underwater. I'm gonna show you the red spotted newt, which is a very common one in our area. This is the red spotted newt, and it's very common in our area. These are the newts that live most of their life in the water. Now that we've learned so much, let's head over to Josie to learn about turtles. Hi everyone, just a refresher, my name is Josie and I'll be talking to you about turtles. 
So there are about 320 different species of turtles all around the world, but you can only find eight of those here in Ontario. And I've got a little sign here to show you the different kinds. All right, I'm gonna start with the stink pot turtle. This one's my personal favorite because just like its name, it actually does stink. When you're handling it, if you're poking it or trying to pick it up or if you're bugging it, it'll actually let out a skunk-like odor. And I'm sure all of you have smelt what a skunk smells like. It's not very nice, so don't bother these guys. And next I'll talk about the two most common turtles in Ontario, which are the snapping turtles and the painted turtles. Most likely you've, you've seen one or both of these guys. All right, so first the snapping turtle. Uh, these ones are really easy to identify because of the long tail that they have. As you can tell, all of these ones have really short tails, but these guys have really long tails and they have little spikes on them too. Um, and now the western painted turtles, or there's midland and western, there's two types. Good ways to tell these ones apart is the midland has red stripes on its legs and body, and the western has yellow stripes on its legs and body. And we were actually lucky enough to find two midland turtles. One's small, but one's a little bit bigger. So this is a little baby midland turtle. I think it's really cute. I was really happy when I found this one. You can tell it's midland because of, like I said, the red stripes you can kind of see here on its legs. This guy's really lazy. Usually they're trying to get out of my hands. All right. And unfortunately, we also caught another midland. It's still cool, but we would have liked to have both. But this one's a little bit bigger, so you can see it better. Just get him out of here. See, this little guy is trying to get away, and they do have quite sharp claws, so it doesn't feel too great. But this one you can tell a little bit better because of the red stripes here on its legs. So have any of you guys seen the little turtle heads poking out of the water? I know I have, quite a few times, actually. When they're doing that, they're actually coming up for a little breath of air. But they can hold their breath underwater for 45 minutes to an hour. That's a really long time, but every once in a while they do have to come up for a little bit, take a breath. And you've probably also seen them in the warmer temperatures in the summer. If you're going for a walk with your family, you see a turtle sitting on a rock, right? Well, what they're doing there is they're actually warming themselves up in the sun. Why do they do that? Because turtles are cold-blooded which means that their body temperature is the same as the temperature they're in. So if it's warm outside, the turtles will be warm. If it's cold outside, cold outside, the turtles will be cold. So when they want to warm themselves up, if they're too cold, they just sit on a rock in the sun. But it's the other way around too. If they're too warm, they either sit in the shade to cool themselves down or they can slip back in the water. This is also known as ectothermic. All right, so now we know what they do in the warmer temperatures, but what do they do in the winter? It's cold in the air, it's cold in the water. What do they do? Well, turtles actually hibernate, but for them it's called bermation. So a little bit different, but pretty much the same. What they do then is they actually swim to the very bottom of the lake or the pond that they live in. And sometimes they bury their little heads in the water to keep themselves warm. And when turtles hibernate or bermate, everything slows down. So their heart rate slows down to sometimes even one beat every 10 minutes. That's crazy. And, but not only does their heart rate slow down, but so does their metabolism. So that means that they won't have to eat all winter. So it, when their heart rate and their metabolism slows down, they can just sit there all winter and do nothing with their heads buried in the mud. Okay, so you're also asking yourself, how do they breathe in the water? If they're just sitting in the water all winter long, and we know that they have to come up for breath, right? Well, actually they can breathe underwater for that long. How? Well, they actually get their oxygen from the water itself. So when the water flows over them, they can absorb the oxygen. And a good, and a place they really like to do this is under their tail or their butt. So turtles actually breathe through their butts in the winter. I know, it's really funny. Okay, so we've learned what they do in the warmer temperatures, what they do in the winter, what do they do after winter? Well, that's the turtle's time to come up and find a mate so that they can lay eggs. And turtles don't actually lay their eggs in the water, they actually lay it on land. 
And sometimes they have to travel really far to find the perfect spot. And they like oh, moist soil or sand to do this. So sometimes they have to travel really far to find that perfect spot. And they're, unfortunately, they're crossing roads to do so. Uh, now we know what they do in the warmer temperatures in the winter. Uh, let's talk about more what turtles need to live. So we all know that living things need water, shelter, space, and food. And I'm going to be talking about food. So most turtles are omnivores, so they eat plants and animals. And some of the things that they eat are snails, worms, water plants, algae, and those are just some of the things that uh, the turtles eat that you can find, all find here in the wetland. But let's talk more specifically about snapping turtles. These guys are a little bit bigger so they can eat the bigger things. And snapping turtles do like meat more than plants. So they eat things like mice, frogs, snakes, even fish. Uh, yeah. Okay, okay, enough about how they live. Do you guys want to know something cool? Turtles can actually live up to 100 years old. That's really old. But unfortunately, not a lot of these turtles can reach that age because of how many are dying in Ontario and around the world. Um, in fact, all of the eight turtles in Ontario are species at risk, which means that they are in danger of becoming endangered. It's very unfortunate. Um, and one main cause of these turtles' deaths are roads. So remember how earlier I was talking about they come up from the water and they travel to lay their eggs? Well, they're traveling over roads. But not only do they get hit when they're trying to lay their eggs, but also when they're just trying to warm themselves up. Remember how I said they were ectothermic? Well, the roads are really warm all, uh, from the sun shining on them all day. So the turtles like to lay down there and warm themselves up. And that's also why they're getting hit. Um, but roads aren't the only reason why the turtles are dying. There's lots of other reasons, and there's an extension video that your teacher will show you uh, that talks more about the causes. And now I'll be showing you a quick little video of how you can move the turtles across the road if you ever come across one. Maybe you can save a turtle's life. Okay, so say this is a turtle that you see on the road. It's going in a direction. You wanna make sure that it stays in that direction because they know where they're going and you don't want to alter their course. So what you're going to do is you're just going to pick it up like a little sandwich and you're going to just see what way it was going and slowly walk in that direction until you get across the road and just set it back down gently. And that way it can keep going where it's going and you just saved a turtle's life. And possibly the eggs it also wanted to lay. So we're down here staining. If you look at all of us, we got these funny suits on. They're basically like giant rubber boots for your whole body so that we don't get wet and cold in the marsh. Let's take a look at our net here. It's got floats on top to make sure that the net stays right on the surface of the water and nothing can jump over or swim through it. And on the bottom, we have the same thing but with weights to keep it dragging along bottom so nothing escapes. Now Mac and Josie are gonna demonstrate how we sane. So Josie will stand here on shore and keep this here. Well, Matt goes out and around in a big C pattern, keeping the net right on bottom and drags it around. All right, now that Matt and Josie have made the shore and the, the net is in this U pattern, you'll have a third member, me, going to the middle here. I will grab each side of the weights. And keep both the weights right on bottom while Mac and Josie pull it into shore. Wow, we learned so much today at Saining Fun. We learned about fish, we learned about salamanders and frogs, and we learned about turtles. Thanks for joining us, guys. Bye! Wow, wasn't that neat? Now let's go meet up with Jenny from Sensational Snakes. Come on.
All right. Okay, so I'm gonna start with a little bit of an introduction. My name is Jenny, I'm here from Sciensational Snakes and I have brought some of my friends to teach you about today. Uh, snakes are incredible creatures, but there's a lot of misinformation about them out there. So we certainly want to correct that and get people to understand the truth about these animals. Now, if you are lucky or you know, live in Ontario and get outdoors once in a while, there's a very good chance you have seen a snake in the wild of Ontario. And if you do see a snake in the wild in Ontario, most likely it is the same species as our first guess. Now we actually have two species here. So the first one on our right, that is an Eastern garter snake. Now I think it's funny because this snake is seen more often than any other snake in Ontario and it's so often called by the wrong name. People call them grass snakes because they see them in the grass. People call them garden snakes because they see them in their gardens. People call them gardener snakes. Okay, I don't know why that is. Nobody has ever seen one do any gardening. But their proper name is garter because a long time ago men used to wear garters to hold up their socks and these garters were stripy. And that is certainly a feature that you can see on Jill here. She is a quite a stripy snake. She has a stripe on the top and a stripe on either side. So garter snake, that's where they got their name. So people see Eastern garter snakes more often than any other kind of snake in Ontario because of their behavior. On beautiful sunny days, just like today, these snakes love to come out and laze in the sun. Now this is another very important thing that everybody should know about snakes, is they are lazy. Snakes' favorite thing to do is absolutely nothing. So when they're out there lazing in the sun, I have to admit though, it's not just that they're lazy, it's also that snakes, like all reptiles, are cold-blooded. That is probably a term that you're familiar with, but I don't like it. I really don't like it when people call snakes cold-blooded for a couple of reasons. First off, a lot of people use that term in a very negative man manner mean and nasty, cold-blooded killers. It's really scary, it comes out at Halloween, Whoa, terrifying. Uh, and of course, I don't want people to get that impression about snakes. Cold-blooded has nothing to do with her personality. You can see Jill is a lovely snake, very friendly. Has nothing to do with, with what she uh, behaves like. What it has to do with is the temperature of her blood. Second reason I don't like the term very much, it can be very misleading. Now certainly in the winter, which we're coming up to, it's gonna get really cold, not my season, uh, but it's gonna get really cold and these snakes have to get down deep below the frost line, way underground, but it's still not really warm. Her blood could be one or two degrees above freezing for the winter. That is cold blooded. But she lives in Ontario in the summertime as well. And even today, it's a beautiful fall day. If she lies out in the sun, she can soak up those rays of heat from the sun. She could easily have a blood temperature that is higher than yours. She could be a hot-blooded, cold-blooded animal. And that doesn't make any sense. That's very confusing. I don't like to be confused. So trying to get people to stop using that term. And instead, this is my mission. I want all of you to use the proper word to describe reptiles like snakes. My favorite word, awesome word, ectotherm. Sounds, you know, like complicated scientific word, but it's not so bad. Ecto means from outside and therm means temperature. All it means is snakes are the exact same temperature as whatever they're touching. If that's you, if you're cuddling a snake in your hands, they'll be the same temperature as your hands. We take these snakes home and we stick them in our fridge. Won't be very long before the exact same temperature as the milk and juice that comes out of your fridge. Whatever they're touching, that's the temperature they are. And so that's what life is like for snakes. Now I did mention we have two species here. So Jill, our Eastern garter snake on the one side, 
but we also have Potato, which is a strange name for a snake, I know. Uh, and she is a red-sided garter snake. And they live in Ontario, but only way up north near the Ontario-Manitoba border. And you may have been lucky enough to hear about the Narcisse snake dens. And that is a very cool place where thousands, thousands of red-sided garter snakes all hibernate in the same place in these dens. So all the snakes from many kilometers around travel to one spot and they all spend the winter together in these caves and underground areas uh, in the Narcisse dens. Narcisse is a place uh, just outside of Winnipeg in Manitoba. And there could be a thousand garter snakes in the space of a picnic table. They are actually stacked deep. So that is what they are famous. In the whole world, it is the largest concentration of snakes in the spring and the fall. Absolutely amazing. One more quick note about snakes. I know some people are like, ew, snakes. And they always, you know, ew and gross and snakes, like those words go together because they think they're slimy. And I do have to admit, especially on the belly, that they can look a little bit shiny and wet and look like they're slimy, but they are not. In actual fact, you guys, everybody I'm talking to, you are all slimier than my snakes. Not trying to be rude or insulting or anything. I'm slimier than snakes, too. Delaney, she showers sometimes. She's slimier than snakes. All of us are slimier than snakes because we have oils on our skin that snakes do not have on their scales. We have sweat glands. It gets really hot, we run around, we get all sweaty, slimy. Some of you get smelly. Snakes, on the other hand, no sweat glands, no oils on their scales. They are cleaner and drier than we are. So if you do get an opportunity to touch or hold the snake, can't use sliminess as an excuse. All right, our next guests oh, love these snakes and like the garter snakes, if you are out and about in Ontario in the daytime, you may see these. They love to come out and lie in the sun. They're diurnal or daytime active snakes. But the garter snakes, you can see everywhere. You can see them in fields and in swamps and uh, even in Toronto, <laughs> who wants to live there? But they do live there. These snakes are much more picky. If you see one of them basking in the sun, you are probably next to a lake or a pond or a river. These snakes are awesome swimmers. And not only can they swim on the surface of the water, they can also hold their breath and dive down underneath. And they have been known to hold their breath actively swimming around underwater for over an hour. That is an incredibly talented thing they can do. But it is important because these snakes do like to eat fish. Fish can stay underwater for a very long time. And frogs, also very competent in the water. Those are the two things these snakes eat. So, if you have a snake that eats fish and frogs, found next to lakes and ponds and rivers, really good swimmers, anybody uh, want to take a guess on what kind of snake this is? Water snake! Awesome! That is exactly right. These are our native Ontario northern water snakes. And as I mentioned, you may get to see one of these out in the wild, and that would be really cool. But, as with all wild animals, there is a very important rule. If you see an animal in the wild, you leave it alone. And I know everybody knows that. If you see a skunk in your backyard, you don't run over and pet it. There's a bear in the way on the trail, you don't run up and slap it in the face. Everybody knows leave wild animals alone. But sometimes with snakes, it might get a little confusing and you know, they're very short, and not very threatening. So you see a snake, you may wanna go over and grab it and pick it up. But of course, snakes are very, very short. These big water snakes are about two centimeters tall. That means that people like you are all gigantic, terrifying Godzilla monsters to a snake. I'm sure you're all very good looking, but to a snake, you are a terrifying Godzilla monster. So if you go up and grab a wild water snake, if you go up and pick it up, it's going to be terrified. It has to defend itself. So they're not 
you know, very tall, they don't look very threatening, but if you grab them and pick them up, the very first thing a water snake will do is bite you. Now these snakes have actually four rows of teeth on the top, two more rows of teeth, on the bottom we're talking about six rows of teeth and they're really really sharp but they're tiny so here's the thing if we actually opened up one of these snakes mouths and you looked in you wouldn't even be able to see their teeth they are that small now they are very pointy they're they're like the little points of pins it is no fun getting bitten by a snake it'd be like taking a little pin and poking yourself a whole bunch of times just a little bit Ow! That is uncomfortable, but honestly, extreme first aid for a snake bite is going to be a band-aid. I mean, you're not going to need it, put one on your forehead, I'll laugh at you, but you know, you could use a band-aid if you really felt it necessary. But obviously it's not that great a defense. You may notice, but if it's a heron or a raccoon or something else trying to eat this snake, they're not even going to notice if the snake bites them. So that's not gonna deter them at all. So these snakes have had to come up with a better way to defend themselves, and I think they have. So northern water snakes, if you grab a wild one, you'll notice they bite you right away, and then they let go. Well, they'll, they'll stop biting you. They have to free up their mouth. And you may remember I mentioned that they eat fish and frogs. Those things smell bad to begin with. Well, after a day or two in a water snake stomach, they are really disgusting and you will find that out because the reason they've stopped biting you and let go is so they can vomit all over you. Disgusting. And I notice they have great aim. They're not just spewing anywhere. They're going to cover you with disgusting, fishy, froggy, water snake vomit. And not only is gross stuff coming out the front end, at the base of the tail, like a skunk, these snakes have special musk glands. All they're for is making horrible smelling musk. Now, they can't throw their musk like a skunk can, uh, but they don't need to, because remember in this story, you grab them and pick them up. So they're in your hands, they're thrashing around, they're mixing this horrible smelling musk in with the vomit that you're already wearing. And because this isn't pleasant enough, through the whole procedure, they are also pooing and peeing all over you. Now our volunteers are very nervous. Uh, <laughs> but it is definitely a very good reason why we leave snakes alone in the wild. Our, our volunteer handlers here have nothing to worry about though, because these snakes, uh, ebb and flow that we have here today, these northern water snakes are not wild. They were born and raised in captivity with people. So they are not afraid of us. They are not going to bite you. They are not going to vomit on you. They are not going to musk you. Honestly, I can never promise about the pooing or peeing. If they have to go to the bathroom, there's a risk you take. Uh, but all those other negative things aren't going to happen. What will happen? If you ever do get a chance to meet a snake up close and personal, what will happen is the snakes will stick their tongue out at you. Now don't stick your tongue out at people because that's rude. Uh, but snakes totally get away with it because it is so important. Snakes have beautiful eyes, I think, especially these water snakes, but their eyes don't work very well. Snakes do not see well. They're very nearsighted and their vision is based on movement. If you're not moving, they can't see you. So they can't rely on their eyesight. Uh, they have no ears. Check all the snakes, always look at a snake. There are no holes in the side of their head. They cannot hear you, they can barely see you. So to have a clue what's going on, they use their sense of smell. And that's where the weirdness comes in in that they use their tongue to smell. So they stick out their tongue. It's actually forked, comes out and divides into two. They wave it around in the air. They're picking up all the little bits of smell in the air. And then they pull it back inside their mouth and stick it up their nose. Here's another thing that you don't want to do. Don't be like snakes. Don't stick your tongue out at everybody and certainly don't stick your tongue up your nose because nobody wants to hang out with that kid. Uh, but for snakes, again, totally normal. And although it's weird, it works really well. To give you an idea, snakes have a sense of smell over 10 times better than a dog's is. 
And because of their forked tongue, they can actually smell with direction. So you know where a sound comes from because you have ears on either side of your head. A snake can actually tell where a smell is coming from because of the forks on the tongue. It is an incredible talent that these animals have. All right, so garter snakes and water snakes, a lot of people see they are pretty common snakes that are widespread in Ontario. But our next set of guests are very, very special snakes. Uh, and the first two I'm going to talk about are very special for two reasons. Now the first reason is these black rat snakes, and I do have to say, perfect name for them, they are black, and if you took a wild guess you might know that they eat rats. They are rodent feeders. So they eat rats and they're black, so they are black rat snakes. Black rat snakes are actually the longest snake species that live in all of Canada. Whole country of Canada. The record snake length for these guys is over two and a half meters long. 256 centimeters. Longest snake in Canada, but they're only found in one province. And that would be ours, Ontario. We have the longest snake in Canada in our province. We win, we're number one. Sadly, the second reason these are very special snakes is they are an endangered species means there's not very many of them left and not very many places you can find them. We have wiped out black rat snakes from more than half of the places they used to live in Ontario. And that is very sad. These are amazing snakes. Now, unlike the garter snakes and water snakes, which like to stick on the ground, these black rat snakes are awesome climbers. They have actually been seen going straight up the side of a brick wall, which I find incredibly impressive since they have no arms and no legs and no sharp edges, no sticky things. They're not like geckos with toes that can stick to something. Uh, they're, they don't have claws like a squirrel to climb up a tree, but they can go straight up the side of a tree. They can go straight up the side of a brick wall. Now the way they do that is these snakes are actually shaped a little bit differently than we think of most snakes. Most snakes we think of as round. The water snakes are very round, but these snakes are shaped like a loaf of bread. They're actually flat on the bottom and flat on the sides. Star and willow might be a little bit fat or chunky, so maybe not as flat on the sides as they should be. Uh, but these snakes are flat on the bottom, flat on the sides, and rounded at the top. So they are like a loaf of bread. What this means is it gives them a corner along both sides of their body, and this corner or edge is very flexible. And they can take that little corner and edge and they can wedge it into every little crack and crevice in the tree bark or brick wall or rock wall, and straight up they go. And that's beneficial. I did mention they are uh, rat snakes. They'll eat squirrels up in trees. But there is a second thing that these snakes will eat. They are rodent and bird feeders. If they are lucky and they find some baby birds in a nest, they have been known to eat little baby birds. So we mentioned how great they are at climbing. Turns out not only are they good at climbing trees, they need trees to survive. So it, it's an important part of their habitat. But in a lot of places in Ontario, along this north shore of Lake Erie, we have cut down a lot of trees and their habitat is gone. So that's why places like this are awesome. Lots of trees, wonderful habitat. Maybe someday there will be black rat snakes back here. Uh, Cause unfortunately there are none now. They have been wiped out. Now the next problem, that they do have are roads. So roads are very dangerous to reptiles. And that's because these black rat snakes, they'll be up in the tree. Let's say they eat one of those big squirrels. They have to get nice and warm to digest. They can't make any of their heat, so they have to get it from their environment. No problem. Beautiful sunny days, they can lie out in the sun. But of course at night, the sun goes down. It gets a lot cooler at night. Notice how much colder it is at night now. Well, let me tell you, if you're cold tonight, if you go to bed and it's really chilly and you, you wanna get warmer, in Ontario, probably the warmest place overnight is on a road 
Because when we build roads, they're dark. We've taken away all the shade. They lie out in the sun all day. They're just sitting out there, soaking up all the heat. 10 o'clock tonight, warmest place, nice road. You wanna get warm? Get up out of bed and you go down and you lie on the road. Soak up all that heat from the road. Now, of course, you are people, you are very smart, you know that you would not go down and lie on a road. That is crazy, it's very dangerous. But snakes are not that smart. They do not get it. So we have built these incredibly warm, attractive places for them, and then we drive on them. And that's where the snakes are lying, they get run over, and it is very, very damaging to the snake and other reptile populations in Ontario. Now there is another snake species in Ontario that has a lot of similarities to the black rat snake and that would be the Eastern Fox Snake. And boy, she is a foxy lady. She is a beautiful, beautiful snake. And these are also an endangered species and they have also been wiped out of a lot of their historical range in Ontario. But what makes eastern fox snakes even more special is that in the whole world the best place to find them is Ontario. We have more eastern fox snakes than anywhere else on the planet. So these are really our snakes to save. And they do seem to live, there is a population of these snakes in the city of Windsor. They actually will live in the city with people. But Unfortunately, they are persecuted or hurt by cats that, uh, house cats that people have let outside. Uh, they are run over on roads. All these things are working against these beautiful animals. But we really do want to keep them around because fox snakes and black rat snakes are pretty much the best rodent control that you can have. They are built to go everywhere the rodents go and they control the populations right at the beginning because they will find the nests of the rodents. And so instead of having thousands of rodents, the numbers are greatly reduced because they control the population at the beginning. These snakes are also wonderful. They cannot, uh, if they eat a bat in an attic that has rabies, they don't get rabies, they can't pass it on. Hantavirus is a thing that mice carry that can kill us. These guys eat those mice and that virus is gone. They can't carry it, they can't pass it on. Their physiology being ectothermic, they are very different than we are. So the diseases, they're just controlling them for us, making us healthier. Even Lyme disease, which is, can be carried by the rodents and has bigger problems, with these guys, it can decrease the number of incidences of that. So incredibly beneficial, no downside. Remember we mentioned they're clean and dry. They're so clean, they're hypoallergenic, can't even be allergic to them. Uh, so they're just out there helping us, but we need to help them. And it's not just snakes that have an issue with, uh, with our roads and, and problems with habitat in Ontario. So our next guests are a little bit different. Okay. So we have talked a lot about snakes and I have to say I do like snakes. They, they are probably my favorite, but we have awesome other types of reptiles in Ontario. And of course, very, very popular ones are our turtles. And they are very, very important animals in Ontario. And it's very scary because we have eight different species of turtle in Ontario, but all eight species are listed as species at risk. We are worried about wiping out every single turtle in Ontario, and it's terrifying. Uh, our turtle today, this first guest that we have, his name is Bo, and Bo is a Blandings turtle. This is not my favorite turtle name. He is not bland or boring. He's a really super cool turtle, but the first guy to write about him in a book was named Blandings, so his name is Blandings. What they really should be called, I think, is Yellow Chin Turtle. This is the only turtle in Ontario that has a solid yellow chin, so it makes them pretty easy to identify. They also have a very high dome shell. A lot of turtles, like painted turtles, they're like flat, like a pancake. But this turtle has a high domed shell, looks like an army helmet. So yellow chinned army helmet turtle, that'd be a much better name. Um, but they don't put me in charge of these things. So it is a Blandings turtle. 
and like many of our other species it is in a lot of trouble this is a threatened species in Ontario and they do need our help now the big problem with turtles well we've already mentioned roads and the problems that snakes have with them because they are hot and attractive turtles have a little bit of a different problem with roads and the problem is in the spring the female turtles leave lakes and ponds and rivers that they live in the perfectly safe wonderful places to be they leave them and start wandering around on land and of course turtles are very slow they do everything slowly they wander slowly they walk slowly they run slowly everything is very slow so they leave their their lakes and their ponds and their rivers and they start wandering around on land looking for a place to lay their eggs it's why it's the females and why they're out there in the spring they cannot lay their eggs in the water they have to lay their eggs on land that is a thing about reptiles amphibians like frogs and salamanders have to lay their eggs in the water reptiles have to lay their eggs on land so the turtles have to find a perfect place to lay their eggs they will walk for kilometers trying to find that perfect place to lay their eggs and of course in southern Ontario if you uh, if you're dropped out of a plane I'll be nice you'll have a parachute so you land somewhere in southern Ontario if you walk in a straight line within one kilometer you will hit a road there are that many roads here in southern Ontario so this turtle very likely the females when they wander around looking for a place to lay their eggs they're going to encounter a road of course they're not very bright they don't know the dangers of roads they don't know to look both ways and go directly across very quickly they'll just slowly wander off out onto the busy road and of course it is warm so if you're a mother turtle and you're full of eggs it's actually a very beneficial place to take a nap take a break because all that heat is going into those eggs it's going to give them an advantage it's going to make them develop really well and quickly so not only will they take forever to cross a road but sometimes they'll just stop in the middle of it and sit there which of course is very detrimental because they get run over now turtles have that beautiful shell excellent protection they have the carapace on top and the plastron on the bottom you can see a big hard shell on the bottom big shell on the top and Bo is not very scared so he's not doing it but a, a scared turtle they can pull inside that shell and totally protect themselves but not from cars cars and trucks are too big and too heavy and too strong and the shell cannot protect them so that shell that has worked for a million years protecting these animals against the natural predators they have it has fallen short from protecting them from cars and trucks what that means is we are selectively hitting and killing pregnant female turtles mother turtles on our roads and that is wiping out our populations so it is so important and I, and I have a job for you if you are in a car you know if you're very young and you can't drive yet that's no problem that's even better if you're a passenger in a car definitely especially in the spring and summer you have a job when you're in a car and you're traveling somewhere watch the road for turtles and if you are watching if you are looking for them you'll, you'll see them they're, they're not jumping out on the road it's not all of a sudden they're just sitting there on the road so you will spot the turtle if that's what you're looking for you're not paying attention to the you know the road and the lines and all that that's the driver's job if you're a driver be very very careful and follow all the rules and don't hit people and stay on the roads and in between the lines and everything but a passenger you watch for turtles and if you see a turtle and you tell the driver if the driver can safely pull over and safely stop and you can safely get out of the vehicle and move that turtle off the road I want you to realize that you're probably not just saving one turtle you're saving her and all the eggs that she is carrying and if you save her that year she can lay eggs the next year and the year after that this turtle for example well not him but a female version of this turtle could lay eggs for a hundred years in a row you could be saving a thousand baby turtle eggs by taking 30 seconds out of your day and moving a turtle off the road it actually has a huge impact on conservation saving one adult turtle 
Now there are some very important rules. When you see the turtle on the road, make a note of what direction they're going. So the head, that's where they're headed. The tail, that's where they came from. So you wanna know which direction they're going because you keep them going that direction. So you go up to the turtle, you pick it up like a sandwich and take it just across the road. Do not put it in your car and drive it back to the nice pond you saw. That may be where they came from, but now she has to do that whole trip again. Be like you get into school in the morning and then somebody gives you a ride home. Well, that's nice, except now you have to get all the way back to school again. That did not help. So whatever direction they're going, just keep them going that direction and leave them right there at the side of the road. And you are doing an amazing thing that could save turtles in Ontario. Okay. Can you put that one back in the shade of the car? Sorry, okay, now we're gonna get started. Okay, so as we mentioned, if you want to move a turtle off the road, you can pick them up like a sandwich and carry them to the other side. There is one tiny little exception to that. <laughs> that was my joke. Because it is actually, the exception is the largest species of turtle that we have in Ontario. And that would be our snapping turtle. And this is Gonzo. And he lives with us and of course we call him Gonzo because everything we put in his tank is just Gonzo. Because uh, they do like to eat. But snapping turtles, of course they have a, a reputation everybody I've noticed seems like scared of snapping turtles. And I think that is so silly. They are nothing to be frightened of. Now, if you do see a snapping turtle on land, you should stay away from it because they snap. Now the reason that they snap is because unlike the other turtles, well, snapping turtles have a secret. They do have that beautiful big hard shell on the top, and that is awesome protection, protects them against predators, but the secret is actually on their belly. So snapping turtles have a very small shell on their belly. So they cannot pull. He's got a great big head, great big legs, great big tail. He cannot pull inside his shell. So that means he has to snap to protect himself. So the reason that snapping turtles snap on land is they are slow. They can't run away from any predators. So they can't pull into their shell. They can't escape. So the only option they have is to scare the predator away and they do that by snapping. It is really easy to avoid being snapped by a snapping turtle. All you have to do is not walk up to one and stick your fingers or toes or knees or anything in its face. If you leave them alone and if you take a step back, then everything is fine. They are incredibly safe. I did a little research because people were like, oh, dangerous snapping turtles. So I love the internet, got on the internet, find, trying to find things that were really dangerous. And I found out now that chairs are absolutely terrifying. In, in one year, I think it was 2016, over 500 people in the US were killed by chairs. There's chairs in your homes. There's chairs in our schools. And they killed a bunch of, nobody got killed by a snapping turtle in 2016. So these are much safer than chairs, really. So don't pick up a chair and hit yourself in the head with it. And you'll be fine. Don't walk up to a snapping turtle. You'll also be fine. So they only snap to defend themselves. Now people tell me they're going to a lake or a pond, they're gonna go in swimming, and they look in that beautiful water, it's a hot day and they really wanna go swimming, and they look in that beautiful, cool, clear water, and there's snapping turtles in there. Does everybody wanna go swimming with the snapping turtles in the water? Yes, yes you do. You do not wanna go swimming in a lake or pond or river that doesn't have snapping turtles. And there's a couple of reasons for that. First off, you don't have to worry about them snapping underwater. Snapping turtles snap on land because they're scared. They have predators. Snapping turtles underwater have no predators. They don't need to snap in defense. People have actually stood on snapping turtles on the bottom of the lake because they look like a rock. And then they're wondering why the bottom of the lake's moving. Um, and the turtle will just swim away. It's not gonna snap. So they are perfectly safe to swim with. Why do you want them there? That is because of what they eat. So snapping turtles 
they do not like their salads or their vegetables. They are not plant eaters, they like their meat. Now, we have been studying, people have been studying snapping turtles, scientists have been watching these animals for decades. So we have a long list of things that they have been watched eating. And of course, on that list are fish and frogs, of course makes sense. They've also been known to eat squirrels and chipmunks. Uh, I watched one eat a raccoon once. They will eat skunks. Not so great. I watched an amazing video of one eating a porcupine. That is incredible. Uh, I have watched them eat white-tailed deer. They have also been recorded eating moose. And this is my favorite, bears. Snapping turtles eat bears. I mean, what do eat bears, man? They're bears. But snapping turtles eat them. Of course, there is something wrong with this list. Everything on this list is smarter and faster than a snapping turtle, unless it's dead. Dead animals, very slow moving, possibly less intelligent than a snapping turtle. And dead animals have a lovely trait. After being dead for a little bit of time, they start to let off a lovely odor. Okay, it's not a lovely odor. Anybody smell dead, rotting animal? It's ser seriously gross, except to a snapping turtle. He has an amazing sense of smell, and that dead, rotting smell is his lunch bell. He loves to eat dead, rotting animals, which is really disgusting. But think about it. Remember our little story when you're really hot and you go down to the lake and you wanna go swimming and you look into that beautiful water and there's snapping turtles there? If there weren't, he was like, no, I don't wanna swim with snapping turtles. Okay, we'll take all those snapping turtles out of that environment, out of that ecosystem. You know what you're gonna have instead is every fish that's died in that lake. The, its bloaty body is going to just be floating around. The water is not going to be clear. The deer that died on the ice and now the ice melted in, after the winter and now there's just this bloaty, leaky, rotting deer body floating past this dock that you wanted to swim in that. It's all gross, it smells bad. Do you want to swim there? Does anything want to live there? Do, the anim do you want to drink that water? You really don't. So these are incredibly important animals. I think snapping turtles might be the most important animal in Ontario for our health because ecosystems are based on water. You need a healthy water system. And to have a healthy water system, you need something that's gonna clean it up. These are nature's garbage people. They are out there all the time cleaning up, keeping these ecosystems healthy. Without these animals, everything could just fall apart. That's how important snapping turtles are. But of course, they do have an issue. They have a problem because the females leave their lakes and ponds and rivers and go to lay their eggs and they get hit and run over. So if you do see a snapping turtle on the road, please, it's so important. To, to stop and help it. Now, of course, it's a snapping turtle and it's on land, so you do have to stay away from it. You can't walk up to a snapping turtle and stick your hand in front of it, because it's gonna snap. Uh, but what you can do uh, is you can use a, a shovel that you keep in your car in the winter time. You know, you have a little shovel in case you get stuck. Keep that in your car and you can shovel the turtle off in the spring. Uh, you can also find at the side of the road a stick or the Phragmites. Poke it in the face of the snapping turtle. There's a pretty good chance it's gonna snap on. And then you have a leash and you can drag your turtle off the road, nice and gently. You do not pick up a snapping turtle by the tail that is attached to their backbone. It is not designed to take their weight. If you pull up on that tail, you will actually kill the turtle. So never pick a snapping turtle up by the tail. But it is very, very important to help these animals out and keep them around in Ontario. So everything that we have shown you so far have been native Ontario animals. And as we mentioned, of course, wild animals or species that you find in the wild, they really should be left alone. And it is against the law to take a snake or a turtle out of the wild and keep it as a pet. Uh, so it's not a good thing to do. Always leave wild animals alone. 
but snakes are awesome and if you do get enthused about snakes and you think wow they are so great and I would like a, to have a snake I want one of my own there are excellent pet species of snakes out there and my personal favorite is definitely corn snakes so we have a bunch of different colors here these are all corn snakes corn snakes are native to the United States they range from Florida to New Jersey the eastern side of the US and they are what that means from their range from where they live they are very easy going with temperature and humidity whatever the temperature and humidity in your house is these snakes will be healthy they also are a lovely size they don't get too large and they come in tons of wonderful colors and patterns because they have been bred in captivity for thousands of generations so you are not messing with anything from the wild which has definitely a lot of problems so if you are ever thinking or inquiring about obtaining a pet snake keep in mind corn snakes because these are definitely the best pets species I think that you can have hi everyone Ranger M here wasn't that amazing I don't know about you but I learned so much on behalf of Dunk Sinclair and the Environmental Leadership Program, Dan Arpey with the Thames Valley District School Board, Ron Kassir from the Elgin Stewardship Council, and the Catfish Creek Conservation Authority, I would like to thank you for taking part in Marsh Quest. We know this year was a bit different and you couldn't be with us at this amazing wetland, but we hope you had fun and learned a lot about our amazing wetlands in Southern Ontario. This only means that you can bring your parents and friends to Yarmouth Natural Heritage Area and show them the Herb Kebba wetland and teach them everything you learned from benthic macroinvertebrates to how wetlands keep our water safe and finally all the amazing creatures we can find here. You can be the teacher this time. Thank you to Lauren Selby, the co-creator of Marsh Quest. Without her knowledge and expertise, this program wouldn't be what it is today. Did you know you're taking part in an award-winning program? Marsh Quest and the East Elgin Secondary Schools Environmental Leadership Program has been recognized by the International Ramsar Convention for supporting the wise use of wetlands and by Ducks Unlimited Canada as a Wetland Centre of Excellence. Wetland Centre of Excellence supports programs that give children first-hand experience in wetlands while educating them about the need to protect, conserve and restore these beautiful ecosystems. Like Dunk said, you have a very important job to do, and that is to help us by educating your friends, family, teammates, and everyone about the importance of wetlands and how to protect them. You are our future conservationists and the key to a healthier tomorrow.